Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon working at the Royal National ENT Hospital in central London. I'm the head of the sleep surgery department there. What that means is that on the NHS, I treat people with snoring and sleep apnea. I'm also the inventor of this. This is called the PTL TBE classification. And what it's used for is to help people classify what they see in drug-induced sleep endoscopy. So what I'll do in this video is to show you how to use this classification for your own patients who have snoring and sleep apnea problems. During the video, I'll show you diagrams, I'll show you videos, so you get an idea of how this works in real life. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you what a normal situation looks like. This is a person who had no snoring, no sleep apnea when he had this um, procedure done. So this is the back of someone's throat whilst they're asleep. Just to orientate you, we're looking down from the nose at the back of the throat, and here's a palate or uvula on the side here. At the back of the throat is here, the voice box is here, and the back of the tongue is down there at the bottom of the screen. If you look in the middle, that little black spot is going down into the windpipe. So now I'm gonna talk about the palate area, or P on the classification. This palate area is the, if you're not sure about the area, is the dangly thing at the back of your throat in the area above it, the soft palate, the bit that flaps around. Some people call it the punching bag or whatever you want to call it. So how this classification works is that each letter of PTL TBE corresponds to a different obstructive level at the back of the throat, which can be affected in people with snoring and sleep apnea. Now each of these letters are then provided with a number, zero, one, or two. Zero is always completely normal. One shows some obstruction and two shows very bad obstruction. Now here we're on P for palate, and you can see here we're on P naught, which means there's no obstruction, no flutter, no snoring. This is exactly what we saw in the last video. So in this next video, I'm going to show you a P1 situation. This is where the palate falls against the back wall of the throat, causing a flutter or snoring. So here you can see the horizontal slit, which is typical with a P1 obstruction. This is otherwise known as an anterior posterior collapse. It's this flutter that we try and stop as surgeons to stop people from snoring. Now this is a diagram of a P2 palate. This time, rather than a horizontal slit, you have a circular collapse, a bit like a sphincter. You can see this is very different from the horizontal anterior posterior collapse seen before in P1. This circular sphincteric type collapse is often seen in people with lateral wall collapse, which I will tell you about when we get to the lateral wall section. Now we're gonna move on to the tonsil area. The tonsils are these two areas of glandular tissue that sit on the side of your mouth, and they can often cause obstruction in the back of your throat, and you'll see this in this classification. So this is a diagram of T1. I've completely skipped T0, because T0 basically means no tonsils at all, or tonsils that are so small you can't see them. T1, on the other hand, is when you can see the tonsils, but they take up less than 50% of the airway. To standardize this technique and make it as accurate as possible, you should place the tip of the flexible scope at the base of the level of the uvula, and also center your scope at the level of the anterior commissure. To make the calculation easier, imagine crosshairs at the level of the anterior commissure. On the diagram, I've made these as green lines. Using these crosshairs, it is often much easier to calculate if the tonsils are greater or less than 50% obstructing the airway. Here is a video of a tonsil that takes up less than 50% of the airway and therefore it would be considered a T1 tonsil. You can see the uvula flapping between the two tonsils causing the snoring. Now we move on to T2 tonsils. This is where the tonsils are so large they take up more than 50% of the airway. You can see in the diagram above, these tonsils are very large, and I'll show you this in this video. These massive tonsils are completely obstructing the airway. You can see that he only has a tiny airway right at the top from which to breathe from. It's easy to see why this gentleman has obstructive sleep apnea. He'd been using CPAP for over eight years and struggling with this every day. After a 10 minute tonsillectomy operation, he was completely cured and very happy at the end. Now we're going on to the lateral wall. And what I mean by that is basically the back wall of the back of your throat. So you've got the tonsils, so you've got the teeth here, the tongue going down your throat like this. You've got the tonsil sitting there and there. And now look behind the tonsils, this area behind it, the back wall of your throat. What tends to happen is the lateral wall comes in like this. It's at the same sort of level as the tonsils which sit there, but behind it on the back wall, it collapses in and I'll show you this in this classification. So here is a diagram of what I just tried to explain using my hands. The lateral pharyngeal wall is seen there and this collapses in and blocks off the airway. Again, I'm using the green crosshairs to allow me to accurately calculate exactly how much of the airway has been blocked by these lateral walls. Less than 50% is an L1 obstruction and greater than 50% is an L2. You can see here the lateral walls at the top of the screen squeezing the airway very slightly, causing a less than 50% obstruction. This would be regarded 
regarded as an L1 obstruction. Here is another patient with an L1 obstruction and you can see when the lateral walls collapse together there is the uvula in the middle flapping away causing snoring. Now here is a diagram of an L2 obstruction. This is when the lateral walls collapse so much that you cause a greater than 50% obstruction. Here is a typical appearance of an L2 obstruction. You can see the upside down V formation and the lateral walls rub together causing the snoring. This time it's not the palate causing the snoring but it's actually the back wall of the throat. I'm showing you this video because sometimes you can miss little details. Here it looks like an L2 formation with the lateral walls coming together but if you look below you will also see tonsils which are also causing obstruction and which also need to be dealt with. Now this section we're talking about the tongue base, the back of the tongue. Again we've got the teeth here, tongue going down like this and the back wall of your throat there. And sometimes the tongue can fall back and block off your breathing, causing snoring and sleep apnea. And I'll show you some videos and show you the diagrams in this section as well. TB stands for tongue base. And now I'm going to show you tongue base zero or TB zero. You can see here that the tongue base is not touching the epiglottis and therefore not obstructing the airway. You have to also remember that the airway is different at this level. It's no longer the whole of the span of what you can see. It's actually from the anterior commissure, which we've learned about before. And it goes to the back wall of the throat. The airway again is depicted by that green line. A TB1 obstruction therefore is when less than half of that green line is obstructed by the tongue base pushing the epiglottis back and here is a video of someone with a TB1 tongue base collapse and you can see that the obstruction from the tongue base pushing back the epiglottis is coming up to about 50% of the airway which if you remember from that green line just goes over 50% of the vocal cords and here rather predictably the tongue base is pushing the epiglottis past that 50% barrier of that green line leading to a TB2 and this is an example of a tongue base completely obstructing the airway this would be a clear TB2 on the PTL TBE classification. You can see this time that the snoring is coming from the flutter between the tongue base and the posterior wall. Now we're going on to the last bit which is E on the classification or epiglottis. Epiglottis is a part of the voice box. It's meant to stand proud at the bottom of your tongue so the tongue's coming down like this, back wall of your throat is there, your teeth are here, your nose is up there coming down and your epiglottis stands like this. And when food comes down or water comes down, it hits this area and goes round this area. So it doesn't all just pour down into your lungs. It goes round and goes down your gullet. Uh, it's not meant to collapse down like this, but you'll see in these videos that the epiglottis sometimes collapses down and blocks off your breathing. That's not what we want to happen. Let's see it in these videos. Now to simplify matters, there is only E1, there is no E2. So if you see any obstruction from the voice box, the epiglottis or some other area, that would be considered an E1. Here you can see the epiglottis flapping back and obstructing the airway. This occurs in about 1% of people and it tends to be the people who find it very hard to use CPAP. If you imagine the air blowing in and then suddenly the epiglottis flapping back, the patient immediately feels suffocated and has to take the CPAP off again. Now what I'm going to do is show you some videos, almost like a quiz, so you get an idea of how the classification works. There'll be sort of videos that go through all the different parts of the classification, so you can pick out what it looks like in real life. And hopefully after seeing this, you get a better idea of how to use this in your own practice at home with your snoring and sleep apnea patients. So here is the first case. As you can see, the palate isn't moving at all, and that's because the tonsils are in the way, and they are huge, definitely a T2. I'd call the palate, therefore, a P0 because it's not moving at all. The lateral wall doesn't seem to be moving at all, and if you look further down, you can see that the tongue base is also very large, and therefore, that's pushing back the epiglottis. At some points, you can see the epiglottis seemingly obstructing a bit like a trapdoor, but because the tongue base is pushing the epiglottis back, this is not an E1, this is definitely an E0. This is the second case now and I've skipped through the palate to speed things up but you can see that there are no tonsils to speak of so that's a T0. The lateropharyngeal wall is collapsing a little bit, less than 50% so that's L1 but the tongue base is causing most of the obstruction and is TB2. There is no epiglottic involvement so that's E0. This is an interesting case. It's a P1 because there's a horizontal slit rather than a sphincter type collapse. There are no tonsils to speak of, so that's a T0. The lateral wall collapses in over 50%, so that's L2. And the tongue base is approximately TB1. This case is interesting because I think it shows that you should not use a anterior posterior palatal collapse or P1 as a marker for someone who should have a hypoglossal nerve implant. This person would do extraordinarily badly with an implant because he mainly has a lateral wall obstruction, not a tongue base one. 
So hopefully now after seeing all those videos, you have a better understanding of how this classification works and you can start using this on your own patients in your own, uh, in your own practices. And this will help you with your sleep apnea and snoring patients. If you like this video, please do subscribe because with time, I'm going to try and bring out more videos that tells you what to do when you see one of these classification problems. You see, if you have got a problem with the lateral wall, what do you do about it? If you've got a big lingual tongue base, what do you do about it? If you've got a muscular tongue base, what do you do about it? So I'll try and go through videos and give you advice about uh, what to do in each of these situations. And hopefully that will help you get better results with these patients because they deserve it. These people have been sleep deprived for years and years and trying to help these people is really rewarding and I really recommend that you keep pushing ahead and keep helping these patients.